Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. So good afternoon and welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council webinar on practical and effective methods of pain control. My name is Stacey Domalewski. I'm the Beef Extension Assistant at the BCRC and I'll be your moderator tonight. You and approximately 150 other people from all across Canada as well as some international guests have registered for tonight's webinar. And as usual, approximately 70% of you are cattle producers. The session tonight is going to last for approximately one hour, but may go a little longer depending on the question and answer period towards the end of the hour. If you're on Twitter, you can tweet along with us using hashtag beefwebinar. We are recording this session tonight, so I will email out a link to the recording to everyone that is registered within the next couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything and want to watch it again later, you can. I would also encourage you to take some notes throughout the presentation as it might help you to remember some of what we hear tonight. So of course throughout the, out the webinar tonight you'll be able to hear and see all of the presenters but we're not able to hear and see you. So if you want to communicate with us just type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have any questions for the presenters throughout the webinar you can type them into there as well and they will answer them at towards the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight it might help to close the webcam window. That means you won't be able to see us but it'll hopefully make the audio come through a little more clear and the video or presentations load a little faster for you. So here's what we're going to be covering for tonight. First, we'll hear from the Executive Director at the BCRC. Next, we'll hear from Dr. John Campbell on practical and effective methods of pain control. Then we'll open it up to questions from you. And we'll finish by letting you know where you can find some more information that you'll be interested in and can use on your farm and ranch. So with that, I am pleased to introduce Andrea Brocklebank. Andrea is the Executive Director of the Beef Cattle Research Council. She works collaboratively with the industry to oversee the delivery of a research program through the BCRC and Beef Science Cluster, which funds research projects that, in areas that are important to the Canadian beef industry. Is that working now? Yep, you're good. Perfect. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have been very pleased with the webinar process and engaging producers across the country and even internationally. Uh, the, I'm going to give a brief overview of who the BCRC is prior to getting into our, our keynote speaker here, but um, producers in Canada pay two checkoffs. We pay a provincial checkoff and a national checkoff. Our provincial checkoff um, varies by province, but is allocated to provincial activities including advocacy, policy, research, marketing, and promotion. And what we also see is, is a portion of that provincial checkoff um, goes to Canadian Cattlemen's Association via assessments to um, do advocacy, trade, legal, policy at a national level. The other thing we have is a national checkoff which funds uh, research and marketing through the Canada Beef Inc. and BCRC. And that one dollar uh, goes to our two organizations for those activities. On average, BCRC receives about 16 cents of every national checkoff dollar and we allocate that to research projects across a suite of programs covering everything from beef, uh, beef quality and food safety to animal health and feed efficiency, forages, all of those areas. We focus heavily on leveraging that funding, primarily with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada funding through the Growing Forward 
programs, uh, particularly the Beef Science Cluster Program, but also leveraging other government funding and other industry uh, funding. Typically what we're able to do for every $1 invested by beef cow producers through the National Checkoff, we're able to leverage about $3 in federal contributions and then additional dollars through provincial or industry contributions. So like I said, I, our primary mandate is to fund ongoing research and capacity initiatives. And we do that primarily through the science cluster. Uh, but we're also really focused on extension, hence the reason we're here tonight. Uh, we are focused on getting results out to producers and to encourage the more rapid adoption of new technologies and innovations. We're also focused on the delivery of the National Verified Beef Production, working with our provincial programs and coordinators to move forward with the on-farm food safety program, as well as the development of three additional modules in animal care, biosecurity, and environment. And the one other thing we do is the National Beef Research Strategy, which in essence is really focused on working with our funding partners, both at a government level, but an in industry level, to just better coordinate limited beef research funding to be more efficient with what we have and ensure that we're addressing all of the research capacity and infrastructure priorities that we have as an industry. So as I said, our primary funding currently is allocated through the science cluster. It's a $20 million investment over five years, $15 million of federal government funding through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and $5 million industry. The cluster that we currently have started in 2013 and will run until 2018, and, and the breakout funding is, is as outlined. I think it's very significant to say that what we've been able to do with the cluster is build a very comprehensive program to ensure we're addressing a multitude of areas across various priorities um, and we've also seen a, a large increase in the funding allocations. Uh, the first cluster between 2009 and 2013 was about 10 million dollars whereas the second cluster is 20 and that's thanks to increased industry contributions but also developing a, a very comprehensive strategy to present to government for funding. As I said, it's a partnership between the Government of Canada and BCRC, but we also have a lot of provincial industry partnership and government partnerships involved in the science cluster. So we do, it's a very collaborative program, and we're pleased to see the, the level of coordination going on from a funding perspective. The other primary focus, as I talked about, is around extension. We have our beefresearch.ca website. And a lot of our activities there are focused on uh, doing blogs, regular releases of topic pages, fact sheets, those types of things. I would encourage you to subscribe if you're not already um, at beefresearch.ca to follow us on a regular basis um, in addition to obviously getting notices about future webinars. The one last thing I want to talk to you about is, is the beef national beef research or national beef strategy. The BCRC is working in policy, um, partnership with our national policy and marketing organizations, as well as our provincial organizations. And, and the focus there is to develop and advance a national strategy for the industry. It's about establishing clearly defined outcomes under four pillars, increasing beef demand, uh, reducing competitiveness issues, increasing productivity, and also improving connectivity of the industry between sectors and with the public, consumers, government, and our global partners. The strategy is really focused on setting out very clear, clearly defined outcomes relative to policy, research, and marketing. They're to be focused on over the next five years. Achieving the goals established in the strategy, though, will require increased investment by producers through national checkoff. Consequently, I would encourage you to review the strategy at www.beefstrategy.com and attend your regional and provincial producer meetings this fall and winter where discussions are taking place on the strategy. We see a lot of uh, potential in the future of the Canadian beef industry and this is an important strategy in terms of the fact that we have extraordinary collaboration between all of the national and provincial partners and a tremendous opportunity in front of us. But most of all, we recognize it's really important to engage with producers, and we look to this fall as a tremendous opportunity to do so. And with that, I'll pass it back to Stacy. Thank you very much, Andrea. So if anybody has any questions for her, please feel free to type them into the question 
box on the side of your pan um, control panel at any time, and she will make sure and answer them at the end of the webinar tonight. So next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Cam John Campbell. Dr. Campbell is currently the head department head of the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences at the Western College of Veterinary Med Medicine in Saskatoon. His main research interests are beef cattle production, medicine, and anti antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Campbell was also a member of the developmental and scientific committees when the code of practice for the care and handling of beef cattle was last updated. So with that, Okay, can you hear me okay there, Andrea? Yeah, we can. All right, awesome. And I'll just try to get my uh, presentation going here. All right, can you see everything there okay, Andrea? Um, now we can, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thank you uh, again, Andrea and Stacy, uh, for having me uh, here again. And, and I always find it kind of weird talking to my computer in an empty office, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, try to make it like I've got a room full of people in front of me. Um, kind of got this daunting task to talk about pain control in, in uh, 40 minutes here or so, and uh, we'll try to whip through some of it. and and talk about a number of different things. I want to talk a little bit about the code of practice. We spent a lot of time uh, working on that over the last few years and it's uh, out there in the hands of producers now. Uh, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that and what's in that, what's, of, uh, what's different in it uh, and what's coming down the road in the code of practice. Talk a little bit about the difference between beef calves and dairy calves in terms of the research into pain control and, and just briefly mention some of the differences there because there's a lot of research on dairy calves, not as much on beef. Uh, then we'll spend a little bit of time about talking how do we actually measure pain and, 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 and identify pain in cattle. And then we'll go into a little bit of a pharmacology on analgesics and anesthetics and then talk about some of the painful procedures. So, you know, I used in a fairly old-fashioned kind of Western picture here, somebody's uh, uh, castrating their calves and, and uh, uh, we still see people do it that way on the prairies, but uh, it's really not that old-fashioned. If you look closely in that guy's back pocket, he's got a copy of the code of practice there. So um, it's not... Uh, it's not that old-fashioned because that's just come out in the last year or so and, and uh, has a number of issues associated with pain control in it that we want to address today. The National Farm Animal Care Council codes of practice are, have some guiding principles and the first is that they're science-based and, and Stacy mentioned that, that I was part of the scientific and the advisory committee uh, and so the scientific committee went through the literature and looked at some of the priority issues and tried to identify where the gaps were, what we knew for sure, uh, and tried to make uh, inform the code uh, committees as much as possible through what science was out there. The codes are supposed to reflect wide variation in production practices across Canada, and they have to reflect what's practical on farms and ranches. They're not a how-to farm manual, uh, but hopefully they're they're scientifically informed and they're practical uh, and they reflect societal's expectations. So it's kind of this consensus between science and society and industry uh, putting those all together and so it's a real challenge in some of the issues to, to try to address uh, all three of those. As we go through the codes and we'll talk about a few of the topics in there, uh, you'll see that there's requirements and then recommendations or best management practices. Requirements are things that you should be doing and, and you know there's no police out there checking that everybody's doing them all but uh, probably expected that the industry is complying with those kind of practices and then the recommendations or best management practices aren't necessary but they're probably good management practices to consider. So Stacy, if you want to go ahead and put that first poll question up, uh, we've got two or three poll questions to do as we go through the thing to keep you guys engaged. Uh, so if we could get that up that'd be great. 
All right, so our first poll question is, how familiar are you with the revised beef co cattle code of practice? So I've never heard of it, I've heard of it, but haven't read it. I've glanced at it at least once, or I've read it and are familiar with the contents. So your answers here are completely anonymous. So go ahead and click those. Right, so it looks like about 26% have heard of it but haven't read it. About 19% have taken at least one look at it. And about 55% say that they're familiar with the context. Great. Thanks, Stacy. So that's getting better. We're getting uh, more people that have that have heard of it, and and that's awesome. Uh, I have done that kind of poll a few times with uh, clickers at a few other seminars and stuff like that, and it gets better every time we do it. So that's great. So as we went through that, probably the most <coughs> difficult issue to reach consensus on throughout the throughout the whole uh, procedure was uh, was this painful procedures part, castration, dehorning, and branding. And and uh, it took us longer there to probably reach consensus than anywhere else, and and probably reflected that that the issues around the science were difficult and complex. Uh, society had some expectations there, and we as an industry had some movement to make there as well. So so those those were the toughest areas to make to to reach consensus on. Um, some of the guidelines. Uh, that we already had in place that were out there already were things like uh, uh, the OIE or the World Health Organization for Animals. Uh, they came out in June 2012 and said cattle should be castrated before the age of three months whenever possible and producers should consult their veterinarians about pain control. So they're already talking about pain control at a global level um, and uh, uh, that's already out there to some extent. The CVMA position statement, uh, that that had already been in place and, and the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association said that, you know, the negative welfare impacts of castration at the time uh, at the time of weaning of extensively reared beef cattle can be minimized by the use of an epidural local anesthetic and the use of systemic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So they're stock talking about using pain control certainly at weaning if we're going to castrate calves that late. Uh, local and epidural analgesia, and we're going to talk more about these things, will improve the welfare of the animal during castration and pain mitigation following the procedure is also needed to prevent unnecessary animal suffering. So other people are talking about these same things and it's not just in the code of practice. In the meantime, the dairy code had already been completed and there's actually lots of pain research done in dairy calves. The dairy code had been done, uh, they had some fairly strong statements about pain control in there and, and when you start talking to animal welfare advocates and consumers and people in society, they don't necessarily see any differences between beef and dairy cattle. Uh, they're all cattle and probably physiologically they're fairly similar. Uh, so why wouldn't we be exactly the, the same as the dairy code? But there are some important differences, and the first is that beef calves aren't usually accustomed to routine handling, and, and that's very obvious when we're trying to do research projects and things like that, and just the act of, of restraining that calf and doing something to it is a pretty stressful event in the life of that calf, whereas a dairy calf, uh, they are exposed to people every day, they're fed by people, uh, they're restrained quite often, uh, so it's quite a, bit, quite a bit of a different situation. Just the fact of processing those calves requires separation from the dam, which is a fairly stressful event. And then when we do processing of any kind on calves, it's usually done in reasonably large groups on one day. Uh, so there's time constraints that we maybe don't have quite the same in the dairy industry as we do in the beef industry. So I want to move on and talk about how we can measure pain in cattle and and this is this is where it gets complicated at times because there's so many different methods and it can be somewhat confusing. The first way we can measure pain is by using physiological measurements, so measurements of of responses in the body and so you know, simple production responses like feed intake and average daily gain can sometimes reflect pain. Obviously, heart rate will go up when, when an animal is feeling painful. Uh, we can use electroencephalography or EEG responses, brain waves uh, with sophisticated equipment to monitor, monitor pain responses. One of the most common physiological responses that's used is cortisol or the stress hormone. And that can be measured in a number of different ways. It can be measured in the blood. 
it can be measured in the saliva, and uh, we've been doing some research here looking at hair cortisol as a as a potential way of measuring that stress hormone. The trouble with with the blood and saliva, especially in beef calves, just the fact of taking the sample is a stressful event and can raise the cortisol levels all on their own. Uh, so it becomes a little more difficult using those those uh, stress hormones sometimes to evaluate pain in beef cattle compared to dairy cattle. There's also a uh, very sophisticated uh, um, technique to look for a sp very specific protein, a neuropeptide substance P, which is, uh, which is a protein that's uh, created in the body, a neurotransmitter that's associated with pain and, and has been shown in people to be very associated with pain. Uh, there's been some neat research done out of Iowa State and places like that looking at it in cattle, uh, and there's some interesting results on that. Very difficult to do the laboratory work on that so it's not used as commonly in a lot of the trials. And then finally, uh, sophisticated cameras that do thermography and measure heat and inflammation can sometimes be used uh, to evaluate pain. So those are all sort of physiological ones. Every trial is a little bit different depending on what the painful procedure is, but those are some of the things that you'll see done out there. The other aspect that we can measure is behavior and again, we can measure behavior in a variety of different ways. We can measure eating behavior, uh, walking behavior, so in castration stride length has been one that we've looked at a lot, that calves that get castrated tend to not take as big a steps after they're castrated because it hurts. Uh, so that's that's an easy one to look at in calves, or well it's not that easy in beef calves. Uh, pedometers, uh, so we've used other things so that we don't have to uh, interfere with the calf so much, so we can put a pedometer on their leg and measure how many steps they're taking or an accelerometer, which is basically just what's inside the Wii controller that your kids have. So when they're playing with their Wii and swinging that thing around, it's got an accelerometer in it that's measuring the angle and the speed of the movement. And with an accelerometer on the leg of a calf, we can tell whether the calf is standing or lying and then measure behavior without having to monitor it continuously uh, over a fairly long time period. We can look at things like shoot behavior and how they how they react in the shoot. Uh, and Joe Stuck, he's done some novel research using strain gauges. To, uh, got the engineering department to create some of those so we can measure how hard the animals pull against the shoot or push against the shoot when they're when they're being restrained there. We can look at things like exit speed. How quickly do they want to get away from whatever we did to them? Vocalization, uh, the number of different studies looking at vocalization as a, as a measure of pain. Certainly one of the most common ones over the years has been videography where we measure behavior, we take videos and watch the animals and then count specific behaviors like tail flicking or head shakes. The trouble with videography is it's so much work that they, you have to video the animal and then some poor grad student has to look at that video for hours on end and, and count whatever behaviors they're trying to count. Uh, so it's very labor intensive and that's why a lot of, a, lot of the research has gone to more automated methods of, of determining behavior like the accelerometers and things like that. And finally, other visual scoring systems where we go in and scan the animals and score their behavior in a variety of ways. So here's a picture of measuring stride length. Uh, again, in beef calves, that seems like not a big deal. We run the pass there. We just take their picture, a video as they're going through there, and we can measure their stride length, uh, how big a step they take with their back feet. But you've got to remember that every time you do that, you've got to get that group of calves in. You've got to separate them from their dams. You've got to run them through the chute. And so it's a big interruption to their sort of normal behavior of their life. Uh, when every time we want to measure stride length. If we want to do it every day for, for three or four days after a certain procedure, we're bringing those calves in every time to do that. So it is, even though it seems not too much interference, it is a fair bit. And this calf, you can see, has got a number of little contraptions on its leg. It's got an accelerometer on that back leg, so we can measure an angle there and get that data out a couple weeks later and tell how many hours a day that calf has been standing in line. And it's got a pedometer in that little uh, contraption on its front leg. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the pharmacology and what kind of drugs we have available for pain control. And for some of you, you'll know lots about this and others may not know very much. So I'm going to start from square one uh, and talk about the difference between anesthetics and analgesics. There's two names that we throw out all the time. Most of you probably know what they mean, uh, but they are confusing because they do sound very similar. 
Anesthetic drugs are any substance that causes a lack of feeling or awareness and it dulls the pain to permit surgery and other painful procedures. So usually it's the drug we use when we're doing a surgery, when we're doing a painful procedures. And in cattle, that's primarily the use of local anesthetics. We use things like lidocaine, uh, just like the dentist uses local anesthetics to numb us when, we're, when they're doing a procedure on our mouth. Uh, we do that in cattle primarily in a variety of ways, especially during surgery. Uh, we use local anesthetics. We may use sedatives as well, which is really a classification of an analgesic drug. And an analgesic drug is any medicine that relieves pain. So in people, we use analgesics all the time. We use Tylenol. We use uh, uh, ibuprofen, we use aspirin, those are all analgesic drugs and many analgesic drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. So that's a very common class of drugs that we use both in people and in animals and in cattle we have three NSAIDs that are, use, that are licensed for use in cattle. We have ketoprofen or anafen, we have flunixin megalamine or banamine, and then we have meloxicam or medicam. So we have three injectable products that are licensed for use. There's also a oral aspirin available, but, but the, the duration of effect is so short, it's not a much benefit uh, to us at all. So those are really the only three non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs we currently have licensed uh, right now in Canada. And then sedatives, such as xylazine or rompin, and you may have had your veterinarian give, give your a cow or a horse some romp and to, to sedate it at some point. Uh, they also provide some pain control and some analgesia and in some cases we use xylazine in, in things like epidural analgesia in local anesthetic as well to help dull pain but also to produce some sedation. So those are the, those are the main drugs that we're talking about here uh, when we're talking about that. And I want to talk about those three NSAIDs just briefly. The first one we'll talk about is ketoprofen or anafen, and on its label it says uh, it's for the symptomatic treatment of fever, pain, and inflammation associated with a variety of conditions, including, and then it gives a big long list of lists of conditions. It doesn't say anything about pain associated with castration or pain associated with uh, dehorning or any of those things, but it does mention pain at least in its label. It's a fairly short plasma half-life, although it's tissue, it binds to tissue fairly well and lasts a little bit longer. Most of the dose is eliminated in the urine within 24 hours of administration. And uh, you'd give that one either intramuscularly or intravenously daily uh, for up to three days in total. Uh, it's got about a 24-hour slaughter withdrawal, so if you give it to an animal, uh, you can't send that animal to slaughter for at least 24 hours. Flunixin has been a lot around for a long time, again, licensed for cattle as well, or uh, the trade name Banamine by Merck. Uh, it's identified, its label says it's indicated for the control of pyrexia or fever associated with bovine respiratory disease, endotoxemia and acute bovine mastitis. And it's also indicated for the control of inflammation associated with endotoxemia. So a common th theme that you're going to see with all of these NSAIDs is that they have are anti-inflammatory, just like it says in the name. And banamine actually doesn't have anything associated with pain on its label. It just has things to do with fever and inflammation on its label, although we do have some good research uh, uh, done here at WCVM that shows that banamine is actually effective at controlling pain uh, post-castration in conjunction with some local analgesia. Again, it's got a little longer meat withdrawal and it's also got a milk withdrawal for uh, dairy cows. And the half-life's a little bit longer, varies between 8 to 12 hours. The final one, the final NSAID that we've got is Meloxicam, uh, trade name is Medicam by Boehringer. It's an aid, it's got on its label an aid to improving appetite and weight gains when administered at the onset of diarrhea in combination with oral rehydration therapy relief of pain following debudding, so it's the one that's got some pain management associated with, uh, with dehorning, uh, symptomatic treatment of inflation, inflammation and pain associated with acute clinical mastitis. Uh, it's uh, either sub-Q or IV, and it's got a, a longer meat withdrawal and 96-hour milk withdrawal because it's got a longer half-life, hangs around the tissues longer, so one injection probably gives you almost 48 hours of 
of clinical effect compared to the other ones that probably give you a day or less of a clinical effect. Should have mentioned on flunixin, it's IV only on that one. It can cause some pretty severe uh, tissue inflammation, so it's an IV only injection, whereas meloxicam uh, uh, is either IV or sub-Q. So I want to talk about each of the three sort of painful procedures areas briefly and talk about what we do know and what we don't know. It's pretty limited on some of them, but uh, dehorning and pain control uh, is probably the one we have the most information on. There's, there's a ton of research, mostly in dairy cattle, uh, but tells us a fair bit about that. Our requirements in the code of practice say that dehorning has to be performed only by competent personnel and you should seek guidance on your veterinarian on the availability and advisability of pain control and the big one probably just bud calves as early as practically possible while the horn development is still at the horn bud stage. So it's typically around two to three months of age that horn bud starts to attach to the skull uh, and starts to form a horn, it goes from the bud formation to a horn and it really, really increases the pain level if we dehorn after that fact. So it's really important to get those calves disbudded as early as practically possible. And effective January 1st, uh, coming up this January 1st, uh, 2016, uh, it says use pain control in consult consultation with your veterinarian to mitigate pain associated with dehorning of calves after horn bud attachment. So we're going to institute that pain control is necessary if you're dehorning calves after horn bud attachment in our code of practice. Certainly recommended practices use pulled bulls wherever possible and avoid dehorning at the time of weaning to reduce stress. We should definitely be doing that before weaning if we can. One of our good news stories in the beef industry is we don't have very many horned cattle anymore. The proportion of beef cattle with horns has been steadily decreasing and we've got pulled genetics in just about all the breeds uh, and pulled lines available. So that eliminates the need for dehorning. Uh, we're way ahead of the dairy industry in that, in that regard. And so uh, one of the reasons we probably have less research on dehorning and more happens in the dairy industry is just because of that fact. This is our beef quality audit from 2010-2011 uh, where it looked at cattle coming through the slaughter plant and 87% uh, of fed cattle were pulled and 89% of non-fed cattle, that'd be cows primarily, were pulled. Uh, less than 3% of cattle had full horns. Uh, so percentage of pulled cattle is about 20% higher compared to the, to the previous audit in 1999. Stacy, do you want to run that next question? For sure. So our next question, um, a true or false question, I have to dehorn calves on my operation, so either true, most of my calves have horns, also true, but only I still have a portion of horns with of my herd with horns, or false, my herd is completely pulled. Once again, your answers to these are anonymous. Okay, so the results, um, only about 4% said that most or all of the calves have horns, about 52% said only a portion have horns, and 44% said that their herd was completely pulled. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks, Stacy. Well, the other good news about dehorning is that we have a very practical and relatively easy method of providing local anesthesia. So this diagram is out of a textbook, Nordsee's Food Animal Surgery, uh, and it shows the placement of a needle if we want to give lidocaine uh, to block the nerve uh, route to the horn. So there's a little crest sort of between the eye and the horn bud there, uh, that uh, little frontal bone, and just under that frontal bone you place that needle about halfway along there, and it will be right at the corneal nerve, and will uh, effectively block that, that that horn bud when we're dehorning them. And the effects are fairly dramatic. Uh, ideally, we would, we would give it some time to work, just like the dentist comes in and blocks you and then walks away and leaves you alone for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, ideally, that would work. But I've got to say that I do this fairly routinely when I'm dehorning beef cattle, even on big days when we're doing a whole whack of calves in one day. I don't wait. I, I give them the injection. I might vaccinate them or do whatever else I have to do. Uh, and dehorn them last, and but and give them the 
give them the local anesthetic at the very first and then dehorn them last, uh, but I probably am not waiting more than a couple of minutes. And I would say the vast majority of them, I get a very good block right away. Uh, the odd one probably doesn't take because I didn't give it long enough, but I expect I still provide some pain control uh, for a few hours after, after the procedure as well. So it's a very simple technique. You just put about two and a half mils of lidocaine in each site. Your veterinarian can show you how to do this. Lidocaine is a veterinary only drug that has to has to come through your veterinarian, and 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 they're probably going to be reluctant to give it to you without giving you some training about how to use it. Uh, but uh, very easy technique, and anybody can learn how to do that. I've got some videos here, and they're not very good quality, I apologize, but uh, they don't have to be very good to see the differences here. I just want to show you. Now, this, this calf, uh, the first calf is being dehorned, and it, it's had uh, no local anesthetic, so uh, no lidocaine at all. And you can see that it's going to jump and respond very, very dramatically to that. Uh, now Chris is going to give it a local anesthetic injection, a different calf, uh, and he's finding that corn, that that crest uh, there, and just putting about two and a half mils of lidocaine in underneath that crest. Uh, and it's as simple as that. It takes almost no time at all. Uh, and then he's going to go do the other horn. And then they probably waited a few minutes before they did this, uh, but watch this calf. Uh, again, just local anesthetic, nothing else, no sedation, and uh, you can see that it doesn't like being restrained very much, but it's not reacting at all to the dehorning iron. So it's really dramatic, and even when I do beef calves and I'm not giving it very much time uh, in a dairy barn, I'd go through and I'd, I might sedate the calves and I might uh, give them a local block and, and uh, uh, line a bunch of them up and do them all at once. Uh, but uh, in the beef herd where we're running calves through and we're, we've got to restrain them, we've got to keep it moving, you can still use this technique. It's not that hard to do, uh, and so I use it very commonly. So dehorning take-home messages, there's lots of research on, out there on it. I uh, don't have time to go through the myriads of research on dehorning. Most of it's in dairy calves. Uh, bottom line is we should be using pulled bulls wherever we can. If we're going to dehorn, we should do it as young as possible and certainly before horn butt attachment. There's lots of dairy calf research showing the benefits of a combination of local anesthetic uh, plus usually an NSAID, and most of that has been done with meloxicam. The ideal situation, I've got one of my graduates uh, uh, left a WCVM a few years ago and she went to New Zealand and she sent me a video uh, from a big dairy farm in New Zealand and she was in a pen with about 30 or 40 dairy calves. Uh, they would sedate them all, give them all local anesthetic, maybe wait a few minutes and then go in and dehorn them all uh, and they're all lying there. They hardly react at all uh, and they would give them meloxicam as well uh, as a follow-up uh, so that they have some pain control for the next day or so. So I use local anesthetic and meloxicam at beef calves, and I don't wait long after administration. I don't want to hold up the process, uh, but you can see obvious differences in behavior with that, and, and it's a relatively simple technique that just about anybody could learn with a bit of practice. Talk a little bit about branding, and we'll be a little bit shorter here because there's not nearly as much research on branding. Again, uh, branding's decreased in prevalence significantly since the 1999 audit. And in 1999, 25% of fed cattle had brands. Uh, in 2010, 2011, only about 10% of fed cattle had brands, and that's the locations. Uh, so, Stacy, can we go to a poll question three there now, I guess? For sure. So the next poll question is, do you use branding as a method of identification? So either yes or no. All right, so the results for that are about 50-50. 52% um, said yes, and 48% said no, they didn't. Okay, and I expect if we broke that up, we'd, we'd see the geographical differences in that, that, you know, pretty common in Western Canada and uh, probably less common as you move into Eastern Canada. And there's no doubt that, that branding still a ne necessary uh necessary thing in many parts of Canada to pr protect the identification. It's our only really, truly permanent method of identification. Here's the code of practice. 
you know, pretty pretty straightforward on it. It says, uh, you know, use proper equipment, restraint, uh, personnel with training or sufficient combination of knowledge and experience to minimize pain. Uh, under recommended practices, they talk about having the brand size appropriate to the size of the animal. Try to avoid rebranding as much as possible. Uh, try to avoid surgical alterations like waddling and ear splitting with less invasive practices. Uh, consult your veterinarian again on the availability and feasibility of controlling pain associated with branding and then maintain all equipment in good working order. So pretty straightforward, we don't have anything that, that requires us to use pain control there. Anecdotally, there's, uh, you know, Dr. Jansen will tell, tell me you, some of the producers he's talked to in, in uh, Alberta or BC uh, that are using meloxicam after they brand calves, uh, they get home for lunch earlier, or get home for supper earlier, they, uh, the calves get back with their dam faster and they're easier to move afterwards uh, and so they get done their chores earlier those days uh, and they think it's a result of using pain control after branding and, and perhaps uh, castration as well on some of those calves. Uh, but we don't have a lot of good research on, on the pain control after uh, after branding and, and the other issue we have is we don't have a really great method of local analgesia. We have no really good way of doing, of providing local analgesia. So pretty short and sweet but the take home message is for branding it's still a necessary form of ID in some parts of Canada. It's, it's decreasing in prevalence but uh, I, it's not going to go away. We've still got to do it in many areas of Western Canada just to protect, to have some sort of permanent ID, ID of those cattle. The research that's been done, there's been quite a bit of research on the pain associated with branding and there's no doubt it causes pain. Uh, both hot and cold branding uh, clearly demonstrates the pain associated with branding. Freeze branding causes less acute pain at the time of the procedure, so maybe uh, that's one alternative we could think about doing if it's possible depending on the kind of cattle we have and, and the coat color and things like that. Freeze branding uh, is a little bit less painful. But there's no real practical method for local anesthesia available for it. Uh, uh, they have looked at gels and things like that, but nothing really seems to work very well right now. Uh, NSAIDs probably help with the post-branding pain, but we don't have a lot of research on that either. And, and so uh, it'd be interesting to see that. We, we have some anecdotal reports and, and uh, it's probably true that uh, just like they help with post-dehorning pain, uh, they probably do a similar job with post-branding pain. But we don't have specific research on branding to look at in young calves especially uh, right now. Last one I want to talk about is castration. We do have a little bit more information in beef calves here on castration and uh, spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, again, with castration, local anesthesia is difficult. Uh, we could give an epidural injection, and you may have seen your vet use epidurals for prolapses or things like that, where we put an injection of lidocaine into the epidural space. In older animals, if I cast, have to castrate older bulls at a feedlot or someplace like that, uh, xylazine epidurals work really well. You get both sedation and, uh, and some uh, local analgesia with that. But... Uh, you know, some people have tried local anesthetic injected into the cord. Again, is the injection worse than just doing the procedure sometimes? Uh, not really sure about that. Uh, there's been a little bit of research, I think, out of Australia. I think it was on, on a topical anesthetic gel before castration. But there's not a lot of good research to show us any good technique for local anesthesia other than an epidural, which just isn't terribly practical. You've got to wait for five minutes or so or ten minutes after you give that epidural and and so it's not terribly practical if you're trying to get 300 calves done in a day or something like that. Uh, there's a significant amount of research on the use of NSAIDs with castration, but again, that research is complicated by things like age. It's done in all sorts of different age groups of cattle, uh, different types of castration from burdizos to surgical castration to, uh, to bands to other things, uh, and then the different drugs they use. So it can be very complicated when you're trying to look through all that research. Bottom line is castration needs to be done at an early as age as po practically possible. The younger the, younger the better. Here's our requirements for the beef code of practice. Uh, obviously, competent personnel, clean, well-maintained instruments. Seek guidance on your veterinarian on optimum method and timing, as well as the availability and advisability of pain control. So that's in there, right into the requirements. And then castrate calves as young as practically possible. And then 
as we move in, we're going to institute pain control into this. Uh, it's there in the dairy code. We're sort of gradually moving it in. January 1st, 2016, it's going to be bulls older than nine months of age. And then two years after that, we're going to move it to bulls older than six months of age, uh, that it's going to be a requirement to use pain control. This is a review article, Hans Coetze is a veterinarian at Iowa State University. Uh, he did this review article in 2013 and it's already out of date because there's even more articles there. At that time he had 66 different articles, but it was different classes of animals, some of them were dairy, some of them were beef, there's different age groups, there's different castration techniques, some of them included dehorning, some of them didn't. They had different methods of pain control and they had different outcomes that they measured to assess the pain. So it gets really tough to sort through all that and figure out what really works and what doesn't. Uh, certainly the different methods, uh, probably the bottom line is it should be done as early as possible uh, and that the method may not matter so much as, as the timing of the procedure. The different ages is probably more important. And this diagram just shows you, uh, I don't know if you can see that very well on your screens, but this top line along here is the age of the animals in the different studies. So here there's about three studies on very young calves, maybe three or four studies on calves less than three months of age. And then there's a whole bunch of studies done on calves that are eight months, yearlings out here, almost two-year-olds out here. Uh, and then this axis, the y-axis, is weight loss. And you can see that the older they get, the bigger the effect of weight loss uh, after the procedure. This is the first month post-castration. So, so very little effect on these very young animals, pretty dramatic effects of weight loss uh, once you get out uh, to yearling age and older. One of the uh, best studies on young calves that's been out there for a while, uh, actually done Quite a while ago, 2009, it was published in the Canadian Veterinary Journal as a, as a um, trial out of our shop. And Jan Kura, she was a, just a veterinary student at the time. Uh, Steve Hendrick, who many of you will know, and Joe Stuckey in our department, uh, did this study looking at castration beef calves. And they used flunixin or banamine along with a local lidocaine epidural anesthesia. So Jan did this study uh, one summer when she was with us as a summer student. Uh, she had three treatment groups. She had a group that got no anesthesia. All the calves were castrated. She had another group that got an epidural, so a, just a lidocaine epidural. So they put lidocaine in the epi epidural space. And then there was a third group that got epidural plus flunixin or banamine. I think in Jan's study, she ran all the calves through the chute and administered the treatments and then ran them back through the chute. Uh, and did the castration. So she actually had to run them through the chute twice to give the epidural a chance to take effect. And then they measured things, various behaviors. They measured stride length and they measured, uh, they did a visual assessment of the animals and they looked at uh, how many steps they took in the day and things like that. And the results are pretty dramatic. Uh, I don't know if you can see in this graph, but, but uh, this is stride length and you can see that the, the animals that uh, uh, got both epinephrine and flunixin, this group over here in the kind of yellowy orange color, uh, their stride length is quite a bit longer. Those calves, uh, out to about eight hours post castration, had significantly longer stride lengths uh, than the calves uh, that just had uh, surgery or surgery and uh, the epidural. So pretty dramatic effect of the flunixin for at least eight hours uh, start to come together after that at 12 hours post castration. So one of the few papers out there that looked at young calves and looked at the effect of, of a NSAID plus uh, an epidural here and it looked like the combination of the two actually did something uh, uh, fairly significant there. We've done a couple other studies. Uh, this is Mira Collada, one of our summer students, and Joe Stuckey, who you know. Uh, and we looked at uh, castrating young calves using meloxicam at the time of castration. We didn't give an epidural. Uh, we just gave them meloxicam. Uh, we had uh, uh, about 62 Hereford bull calves at our Goodale Research Farm, and they were about 55 days of age on average, uh, ranged from 18 to almost 101 days. And we put them into four treatment groups. We had a group that got castration and then got meloxicam at the time of castration. We had a group that just got castration plus saline, and then we had a group that we didn't castrate. We just ran them through the chute and did everything else to them like the other calves. Uh, and some of those we gave meloxicam to, and some of them we just gave saline to. Uh, and 
we looked at a number of different things. We we ran them through twice through the shoot system and recorded their stride length ahead of the study, and then we st recorded stride length uh, um, a number of times after the study. We used accelerometers to measure their standing and line time, uh, and uh, recorded stride length again at 4, 24, 48, and 72 hours post-treatment. Here's Mira uh, recording stride length. We had a video, video camera set up to measure those calves. That's a lot of work. And, and Jan Kura's study that I talked about previously, she did that really well. It's hard. Those calves will run through that chute, and then it's hard to measure stride length. And, uh, and you've got to separate those calves every time. Uh, it's a fairly invasive procedure in some ways. And so you'll see in the next study I'm going to talk about, we didn't do stride length uh, because we just thought it's not it's not worth all the intervention we have to do with those calves. And then we used accelerometers and pedometers on those calves as well. Well, it's pretty obvious castrates have a shorter stride length. We showed that just like Jan Kerr's study did. Uh, and our calves that we gave meloxicam had a slightly longer stride length, but it just wasn't quite statistically significant. Uh, the castrated calves stood less than the non-castrated calves for about 48 hours post-castration. And the meloxicam treated calves stood longer than saline treated calves. Uh, if they were castrated, but the differences weren't quite statistically significant. We probably just didn't have quite enough calves on that study to make it work. Um, but there we are, you know, bringing those calves in three or four times uh, in the first day or two after after they're castrated. They got tired of walking back and forth to that barn uh, from the pasture for us to measure stride length. So that's pretty significant effort and a lot of manipulation of sort of what their normal behavior would be. They should be lying out with their mothers uh, on the grass and not uh, not be brought into the barn again. The, la the last uh, study I want to talk about real briefly is this hair cortisol study. And again, we've got uh, another su summer student and a graduate student, Kate Kreutzinger, is a grad student in our department, and Travis Marfleet was a summer student, uh, where we looked at hair cortisol. And cortisol is a stress hormone. It's been used a lot, mostly in blood and saliva. And serum, when we measure blood serum cortisol, it gives us sort of the cortisol effect in minutes to hours. Uh, saliva is very similar. Uh, you can also do it in urine and feces, but that's kind of cross-contaminated, so it's not used very much. But hair looks at a period of days to months, and, and it's used a lot in wildlife, so we thought it might be a neat technique to look at, you know, the stress response in cattle uh, using hair. And it's also easier to get, especially from calves. We don't have to restrain them as long. We just have to clip some hair, and, and uh, it's pretty, pretty slick. Uh, so it's not an invasive collection. It's no fancy storage. We just put it in paper envelopes. You can store it for at least a year. Uh, and it's been standardized in cattle, uh, and hopefully it reflects the same thing as salivary and serum cortisol levels, but just at a longer term. So we did that at a couple of sites, our Goodale Research Farm and our Western Beef Development Center. We had three treatment groups. We had a control group that didn't get castrated. We had a group that got castrated and given meloxicam and a group that got castrated and given saline. Again, we did the accelerometers, but we clipped some hair from a patch on the hip. And after two weeks, we reweighed the calves and we, we uh, took the accelerometers off and then we reclipped the hair. So we just got the hair that grew in those two weeks after castration to measure the cortisol response. So there we are clipping calves as they're coming through the chute at the Western Beef Development Center. At the end of the day, we couldn't show a big effect on standing and lying times in this study, and that's probably a relatively crude behavioral measure. It's not as detailed as some of the other behavioral measurements like tail flicks and things like that. It's probably impacted by a variety of things. We did see that the standing times of castrates were longer than non-castrates, but we couldn't show an effect of the meloxicam uh, on standing times. But we do have some promising preliminary results in the hair cortisol levels. The castrated calves that got saline have the highest hair cortisol levels. The castrated plus meloxicam calves have the next highest ones, and then the non-castrates have the lowest ones. So just the way you'd expect it to go. So we're still working on that, but it's got some promising results. So castration take-home message, as young as possible, uh, so that we minimize pain and stress. Uh, local anesthesia is not easy with that and probably not easily performed in the field, uh, but probably provides significant benefits in terms of pain control. We got some promising results for both flunixin and meloxicam as pain control in terms of behavior and hair cortisol in young calves. Uh, there's probably more studies needed for young beef, beef calves, and, and you know, stay tuned. We're going to see more there. So, Stacy, can we do that last poll question, and then we'll just wrap it up here in another minute or so? Sure.
So our last poll question, do you currently utilize any method of pain control when processing calves, either crustacean, dehorning, or branding? And select one of the following, whether it's yes, I do it routinely, occasionally, or no, I haven't used anything yet. Reminder, your answers are anonymous for these. So results for the poll, um, it looks like about 36% said yes, they do it routinely, 11% said they do it occasionally, and about 54% said no, they haven't used anything yet. Yeah, so almost 50-50, that's, that's, uh, that's amazing, and, and we're seeing, you know, more and more producers are buying into it. They use it once, and, and they really like it, and, and continue with uh, some sort of uh, NSAID or something like that for pain control. I guess before we leave this, I think, you know, castration, dehorning, and branding are obviously painful procedures that we do on calves, but there's other areas where we need to consider pain control. Certainly post-surgery, a lot of veterinarians are going to use pain control post-surgery in cattle. Uh, Post-difficult calving is a place where we might consider using pain control both in the cow and maybe the calf as well. And Claire Windeyer at UCVM at the Calgary Vet School is, uh, I think, working on some research there. She's a grad student working on, on that and, and doing some research on that. Uh, lameness, injuries, things like that that are treatable. Obviously, pain control should be a part of that that treatment. And then other potentially painful conditions. Mastitis is on the label for Medicam for dairy cows. Uh, arthritis is on the label for Anafen. And uh, I think those are both conditions that we maybe need to consider uh, pain control in. And there may be others out there as well. So conclusions, just to wrap it all up, you know, I think pain control is becoming more of a priority within our industry as part of our animal welfare mandate. Uh, society expects it of us, and it's part of that social license to operate, and it's something we're going to have to grapple with, I think, as, as we move forward. Um, it, you know, it's back to the future day. This is the day that Marty McFly came back to the future in, in the second Back to the Future movie, and, and uh, uh, that's about the time I graduated from vet school in 1985 when that movie uh, was supposed to happen, and uh, certainly Back to the Future has certainly changed things in terms of pain control and animal welfare in, in the cattle industry over that time period. Um, I guess do the simple things first. It's, it, in most of our situations, it's pretty easy to use pulled bulls. Uh, it, in a lot of situations, at least, uh, we can usually dehorn before horn bed attachment, so those are fairly simple things. They don't cost us a lot. Uh, Local anesthesia is fairly practical for dehorning, easy to learn. Your veterinarian can help you with that. Uh, it's not a difficult procedure. And I think it has a benefit even if you don't wait around for that to work. It's certainly probably going to have some effect afterwards. Uh, castrate at a young age as well. And then consider the use of NSAIDs for post-castration branding and dehorning pain control. And then finally, stay tuned. This is a major focus of research. Uh, this fall, I was in New Orleans at the, at the uh, American Association of Bovine Practitioners Conference, and it's amazing how many of the presentations now are about pain control and animal welfare. Uh, it's a huge component of what's, uh, what's going on in terms of research, and, and uh, I would say at least a third of the presentations uh, were, were sort of along those lines, pain control uh, and animal welfare research. So I'll leave it to that. I'll turn it back to you, Stacy, and, and I'm sure we can take some questions if anybody has some. All right. So we are going to open it up to questions now. So if you have any questions for either of our presenters, you can type them into the chat box on the side of your screen. If your control panel has already closed, you can open it back up by um, using the little orange arrow on the side of the screen. So we did have a few questions come in beforehand. So the first one is for John. What do you feel is the best, best tool for dehorning or castration? Uh, yeah, for dehorning... Uh, probably as young as possible, and so as young as possible uh, is probably the, uh, is probably the uh, 
butane dehorner or, or some sort of uh, hot iron dehorner at a very young age. Um, we used to think that maybe paste dehorning was less painful, but some of the research that's coming out now is showing that it's actually pretty painful and, and it may not be uh, the least painful procedure after all. And I think originally that was, that was sort of thought to be the least painful procedure, but uh, I think they're starting to show uh, some of the research, and, and that's probably been done in dairy calves, I think, but, but showing that paste dehorning is, is quite a bit more painful than we thought it was. Uh, castration, again, as early as possible, probably, I mean, the earliest possible is probably uh, the, the little donut bands that you can do in very, very young calves. Uh, that, uh, again, there's not a lot of research at, on young calves comparing different techniques. Uh, there's research in older cattle comparing techniques, and, and so if you look at uh, uh, heavier cattle, Karen uh, schwarzkopf Jenswin's done some uh, research, I think, that was funded through BCRC as well, uh, uh, that looked at comparing different techniques. Uh, and the bottom line is, I think, that, that they're both painful, they're just painful in different ways. The surgical technique uh, has fairly acute pain. Uh, and fairly dramatic effects in a fairly short time period, whereas the banding technique that you can use in older bulls or older cattle um, has less pain uh, at the time of the technique, but then there's more pain later on for a longer period of time. So, uh, so it's not as clear, I think, there which technique is the best to use. Uh, and certainly in young calves, there's just not as enough enough research so far to tell us which is which is the very best best way to go other than as young as possible. Great, thank you very much. Um, our next question is for Andrea. So Andrea, can you speak on the importance of having Canadian research, um, Canadian beef research, um, especially when it comes to things such as pain mitigation? Well, I think, um, you know, society's changed and, and people are ne don't necessarily have an agriculture background in many cases. And also, too, just there's greater awareness of, of uh, you know, what we're eating and, and questions about it. And so when you look at what we call social license issues, whether that's animal care or antimicrobial resistance, animal transport comes up, pain, there's lots of questions that people have. The other one would be environmental footprint of beef production. And in all of these areas, you know, when, when consumers have questions, it can impact their confidence and so their consumption of product, but it also can impact um, their engagement with policy and regulators. And I think what we recognize is, is we need to have science to obviously inform our conversations with the public and consumers, but we also need to have science to inform regulations. And I think why Canadian research is so important is, is our production systems differ from other countries and areas. So, you know, to use research around animal transport from Europe doesn't necessarily reflect our climate, our you know, sector dynamics, all of these things. And likewise, even in terms of the, the climatic conditions we deal with and the intensity of our operations. So, you know, I know our researchers do a good job sharing internationally, and in many cases we can sometimes adapt and adopt what's going on, you know, within um, beef sectors across the, the world, but also across sectors like dairy, and, and John spoke about that tonight. But I think overall we do recognize there's a need to have a very strong foundation of science to support policy, regulation, um, trade discussions come up in terms of things like food safety and, and how we produce product. Um, but then also to, to kind of inform those public discussions and ensure we maintain consumer confidence. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. So our next question for John. So are scurred bulls the same as pulled bulls, and do they re reduce horns? Uh, scurred bulls are, are heterozygous for the pulled gene, so they're going to reduce horns, but uh, uh, not as much. And I'm, I'm going to apologize for not being up on my pulled genetics as much. I need, <laughs> need a good geneticist here to explain that for me, uh, but, but uh, they're not uh, the same as a pulled bull. Okay, sounds good. Another question for you, um, when using products like Medicam on very young calves, should people be using them at the label dose? 
Yeah, uh, there's no re reason to use them anywhere at, anywhere but at the label dose, and uh, uh, there's no research to show us that they're um, uh, they're not effective at that dose. Uh, we've got no research to show that they could be effective at a lower dose. So uh, so currently, the, uh, that's the only way to use them is at the label dose. Yep. Um, another question for you here as well. So is there an effective way to reduce pain when banding calves? No, probably not. Well, there might be, but it's difficult and the difficulty is the timing of the timing of the uh, of the pain control. Um, and and I guess it depends what age of calf you're talking about, but let's talk about banding uh, an older calf of you know a, a feedlot calf or something like that if you're banding them with the with uh, uh, those sort of bloodless castrators that they use um, and those bands those the trouble with that one is there's very little pain at the time of applying it there sometimes you'll see them go and lie down and stretch out and and be a little colicky for our a short period of time right after you apply the band, but there's almost no pain when you apply it. Uh, maybe a little bit of pins and needles for for a few minutes. The pain probably comes, uh, and Karen's research would would show that better. That the pain comes sometime later when that band is uh, that scrotum has dried up and is starting to fall off, and then you have an open wound there. And so the timing of when you would give that pain control for that calf. Uh, is the challenge with that one, and uh, that that's the that's the struggle, and and so uh, there's, you know, I think think that would be the issue is when do you time that pain control for for banding because it's probably not at the time that you actually put the band on, it's somewhere down the road, and that will probably vary depending on the size of the calf. Sounds good. So another question for Andrea here. So, Andrea, if producers are to invest more money into research, where would that go to in terms of the BCRC? Well, I think the, the first important point is, is one of the goals of, of investing more money into research is, is to maintain, actually, our current research programs. Uh, BCRC, with declining marketings and also inflation eating away since the inception of National Chat Crop, about 25% of, of the dollar that we currently have, um, you know, to maintain current programming at the levels that we have it, so the $20 million science cluster, we need to increase national checkoff. And I, I think it's important to say that we know under the science cluster and other government and industry funding, we're not covering the areas that we need to for research. And to some extent, we're only covering the surface of certain areas. And the other thing we know with industry funding is it's really important to trigger government investments. Um, typically, if industry funds, government will, and, and likewise, if industry's not at the table, there's certain programs that are facing very uh, significant pressure. So some of what we're trying to do is, is just maintain current programming. The other areas that we are looking to enhance focus is, is further focus on extension and adoption. Also looking at uh, further focus on, you know, looking at international research and how we liaise with that and, and you know basically ensure that we can adapt and adopt whatever we see internationally to to work for Canadian production systems um, supporting the Canadian beef advantage and addressing some of the social license issues we have and increasing funding relative to some of the key productivity areas so feed and forage production uh, feed efficiency animal health obviously Thank you very much. Um, so another question here for John. So is there anything really long acting that can be used to put it as a or can be put in feed to deal with problems such as lameness? Um, no, not really yet. Uh, I, I believe and and I don't know a lot about this. Uh, haven't heard a lot, but uh, there is a oral Meloxicam being launched in Alberta, uh, as far as I know. So there'll be an oral product that can be used uh, in cattle 
soon, I think. It's a generic uh, meloxicam. It's an oral dosage form, I think, and will be coming out of, uh, I think, the company's Alberta Veterinary Laboratories. And I don't know what the status of that is, where it is on. I know it's close, and I don't know whether they've launched it yet or whether it's close to being launched or somewhere around that. So uh, I think that uh, that is on the, on the horizon, uh, and that would pr probably be the only product that we that we would have that would be, you know, not long acting, but but maybe somewhat long acting and maybe easier to administer on an ongoing basis to an animal. Great. Thank you very much. Um, another question about the code of practice. So when the new requirements take place in January, are they actually considered law? And if so, how is that regulated? Uh, no, I don't think they're considered law. Um, the, the code of practice is a, is a voluntary sort of uh, thing for the industry and producers. Uh, in some provinces, uh, it's referred to in the Animal Protection Act. So in Manitoba, I think, in BC, and maybe Andrea knows some of the other ones, I'm not sure, uh, uh, maybe Ontario. Uh, they refer to it in the Animal Protection Act. So if there was a complaint about something that was lodged uh, about animal welfare on a, on, a, on a farm and it went to court, uh, they would probably pull out the code of practice as their guideline to say, well, what does the industry say is required and recommended practices? And so, uh, but it's not law. And there's nobody running around saying, "Are you following the code of practice?" Uh, to any detail like that. So the idea is that this is an industry-led initiative uh, that that and it's voluntary, and hopefully it's a document that sort of gives us guidelines for where we need to go and what we need to do. And it also is a document that lets us sort of say to the public, "Hey, this is this is where we are. This we're trying to do this. You know, we're trying to do these things, and this is this is where we're trying to go." No matter what we do, I mean, the people listening to this webinar are not the problem usually, right? It's, you know, we talk about that a lot of times. How do you reach the people that really, really need uh, need it, need to be educated about animal welfare? They're not the ones that go to conferences or listen to webinars or, or read anything that happens at the BCRC. Uh, and so uh, we're still going to have those problem producers no matter what we do. Uh, and I, usually the big problem is not pain control. The big problem is just feeding their cattle problem. Properly. All right. So another question about NSAIDs: um, Do they need to be administered more than once? Uh, there's really been no good research on that. I, I guess depending on the type of pain and and how complete you want your pain control to be. Certainly, anaphen and, and banamine, the first two NSAIDs that we talked about, have a much shorter acting period and and probably need daily administration in this. So if you want to provide pain control for 48 hours, uh, you'd need to do it twice. Uh, but Medicam has a longer duration of action, a, sh a longer half-life, uh, probably has a longer effective period, and so one injection gives you 48 hours. And so they don't recommend uh, two injections with Medicam. They say they say one there. So it all depends on how long you need your pain control to be and how long that has to has to be around for. So if you've got a you know a cow that was a C-section and she's going to have a painful incision for a few days, uh, yeah, you may want to you may want to administer pain control uh, daily if you're using an NSAID like banamine or anaphen. All right. Um, I have another question here for Andrea. Um, do you have an idea of what the numbers would be like comparing um, questions from the general public about pain control versus the veterinary or agriculture sector, or whether it would be more from one or the other? I honestly don't have a, a, an answer on that one. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I will say, and, and this is not answering the question directly, but... You know, I will say when we talk to government, it's important to emphasize that the number of inquiries they get um, is probably more substantial than we get. But um, I know at one point Minister Ritz's comment was um, the most single common letter he got was around animal transport, and, and because that's when the public sees cattle. And so, 
you know, not directly related to pain, but again, a, a social license concern in terms of animal care and animal transport. So there is public questions um, definitely out there, but to say what proportion, I don't know. So um, we do have a few more questions, but we're a little bit um, over time here. So we're going to wrap it up for the night. But I do encourage you to talk to your local veterinarian or a regional extension specialist through your Ministry of Agriculture if you have um, further questions about pain mitigation. So I just have a couple more things before we let you go tonight. So the first is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. You can go to our website, beefresearch.ca, as Andrea has already mentioned today, and you can subscribe to our free email list, and with that, it'll provide you that information as well as give you information on upcoming webinars as well. If you have a Twitter, Facebook, or a YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. And I'd also encourage you to visit the Canadian Cattlemen's Association website at cattle.ca where you can sign up for their free newsletter called the Action News. Also, just to let you know, uh, we do have two webinars coming up in November. The first one is on methods of disposing of mortalities to reduce predation, which will be taking place November 17th. And the one after that will be taking place a week later and will be on how to improve weaning weights, conception rates, and calf health. So as I mentioned, if you're subscribed to our blog, you can find, um, you'll be sent the information there. If not, check back on our website um, a little later on and we should have the information for these two webinars there. So as soon as the webinar is done tonight, um, you'll be asked to complete a short survey that asks about the session and what you're interested in for future webinar topics. We do need your feedback so that we can do the best job we can to deliver information to you that's both useful and meaningful and helps you to make informed decisions on what's best for your operation. So please complete the survey for us and don't hesitate to contact me if you do have any questions. You're also going to be receiving an email from myself within the next couple of days and it will have a link to the recording as I've already mentioned as well as links to some additional information to do with pain control. So that's it for tonight. I want to thank you guys at home for joining us and on behalf of everyone I'd like to thank Andrea and John for volunteering your time and expertise. So good night. Thank, thank you. you.